Nigeria has a long history with its roots in early civilizations of distinguished artistry. Today, we'll be taking a look not just at our history 59 years after independence, but also where we are now. We'll be looking forward to shaping a better image. Good morning, Nigeria, and you're welcome to our live broadcast. We're broadcasting live from our Lagos studio. I am Ekene Ezeji. And I am Amaka Okoye. Now, we'll also be looking at the president's speech, who will be speaking uh, uh, with key decision makers and veterans and, you know, daily Nigerians on the Nigeria of their dream. We have a rich lineup of guests today for you to look at the issues from politics to sports to entertainment and the economy. So, again, welcome. Yes, and uh, with us in the studio, yeah, it's uh, we want to just welcome Tumbosun Akeju, who is a a reputation manager. manager. I like that. Yes, good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, and also Jide Ulogun, you're welcome, a public affairs analyst. Thank you. I'm happy independence. Happy independence, indeed. <laughs> Same to you. Nice okay, so it is, uh, f we are 59 years today. <coughs> Your thoughts, what, what do you think about our Independence Day? It's a day of celebration, some people will say. Just let us know what you think generally. Um, for me, like, yes, it's a day of celebration. At the same time, it's a day of um, deep reflection on where we are as a country at the age, perhaps, of 59. Um, I think that while we're celebrating independence at 59, um, a crucial part of our history is also to look back you know, at how we fared in the last 59 years mm -hmm. and you know, look at our history and learn from those things. I think those are the major things that should be uh, it, it should be in consideration and should be a discussion today. Uh, for example, if I refer to um, some of the conversation last night, you know, on social media, where it seems like the people that are called the millennials were blaming the baby boomers. That oh, the baby boomers ruined the country, and some some of the you know baby boomers are saying, oh, you millennials, you're not serious. We were protesting, you are celebrating and arguing about a TV reality show, and uh, you say, oh, you know, and my own position is. Both sides is a, is a is useless battle mm -hmm. because the baby boomers had 419. The millennials have Yahoo mm -hmm. The baby boomers had bankers, industrialists, and you know entrepreneurs. The millennials have a good number of innovators. Every generation has its own uniqueness. So you're neither with the baby boomers or the No, it's, we have a problem and we should face it. So at, with Nigeria at 59, rather than, you know, be, be in, 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 in the business of, of throwing blames up, left, down, and center, I think that we should sit down and reflect and see when we had 419, what was the impact on the reputation of the brand called Nigeria? Now that we have Yahweh, what's the problem with it? How do we fix it? How do we have processing in place okay. Okay. that will allow us to look at the problems we've had, how we've overcome those problems, and then how can we move forward You know, in, 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 in today's Nigeria? I like the way you hit the ground running. Um, let me ask our other guest, Mr. Jide, do you feel any difference between the celebration last year and this year? Has anything changed, in your opinion? For me, yes. It's gotten worse. And um, you have to look at what people are exposed to. And we were considering three major areas, which we started ruling out about five years ago. Talk about insecurity, you talk about the economy, and you talk about corruption. As we speak, we still have sustained corruption in Nigeria. Because in the private sector, that is what we call returns on investment. If the result we have now, the narrative about Nigeria is what we have, I think we've had investment failure. And for me, as an individual, you, whether you want to admit the need for competition, it's a reality. So I want to isolate a country like Singapore okay. that was in the same poverty bracket with us. Mm -hmm. In fact, they started out in this race of political independence much later than we did in 1960. And today, that country, through deliberate developmental leadership, is one of the best places to live in the world and one of the best places to work in the world. And but I think what it appears we have been doing is to pay lip service, come up with colorful policies that were hardly implemented. For example, 
in the early 1970s when we came out of the Civil War, General Gowon retired, who was the head of state, came up with a very beautiful economic development plan to reintegrate, rehabilitate, reconstruct. What have we done with it? You, you now move to benchmarking our performance with result. As we sit here in the studio, my great country's indebtedness is in the neighborhood of 25 trillion naira. Wow. Recently, it is reported by the government that we spent, I think, about 11 trillion naira on importing refined fuel, which is called under recovery. Okay. Another name for subsidy. subsidy. Mm. All right. And now, let's go back to history in connection with our anniversary. The exploration for oil started as far back as 1903 in Nigeria. In 1956, we were fortunate to discover oil in commercial quantity. In 1958, we joined the business community. Between 1963 and 1965, we constructed the first refinery by the colonial masters. Today, we are taking our crude oil to them to refine. So you find us migrating from physical coloni colonization to mental economic colonization. And it's it's quite and that is just to mention the aspect of our resources, the, the oil and gas. All right. And if you ask me what have we benefited from the oil and gas, I will tell you as a Nigerian, practically I have not benefited so much. And when you look at the mandate of the Ministry of Petroleum Resources, that it should be engaged to improve the lives of all citizens, then you must ask a question. Are we really a wise country or are we otherwise? Despite all the promises we have made and we have come to associate ourselves with making beautiful political promises that are hardly fulfilled. And I, I that like has say. eroded mm. the aspect of accountability. Mm. And sometimes the citizens ask for accountability you have a clamp down, which is again another feature of Nigeria 59 years down the line, which yes. is disrespect for the rule of Mr. law. Jide, so when you put the all this together. I'm to interrupt you is that I want to remind us of how we kicked off with Mr. Tuposin, mm -hmm. where he says, We're not here to allocate blame, we're here to look for the way forward. We're still going to dissect the issue. It's not wrong. about blame. No, you no, see, no, what, just, what's the danger, man? Hold on to that because we're just kicking off. I hadn't even had a chance to ask no, Amaka. No, no, no. That's fine. That's yeah. go, go ahead. I yes. was just going to say that mm -hmm. we will still come to the major issues, which is dissecting the speech because most of the things, some of the things you've mentioned, is. Uh, while addressing the nation are part of the key things that the president talked about. So we'll have time to go into that. So if you want, very quickly, we could go into the, the elements of the speech without mm -hmm. taking uh, words out from uh, Mr. Ologun, who will come to you. So I actually don't think that Mr. Ologun you know, is even a portion in blame. I think it's an attempt, and I, I mean, I, I understand his passion. It's an attempt to dissect what is going on. Okay. Because I picked something very crucial from what he said. He talked about policies that are not properly implemented, uh, promises that are not made. And I say to myself, and I probably I've said it times without number, I'm already sounding like a broken record. We cannot have a proper implementation of policy if there's no policy marketing. I'll give a recent case study. The CBN comes out and issues a, 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 a memo on cashless policy. policy. I feel that it was, it was such an unfortunate move. Okay. Why did you say that? Well, I'll tell you. When we had the pilot of the cashless policy in Nigeria, what was the value, what was the what, was the what of a company called InterSwitch? What is the what of InterSwitch today? InterSwitch is making an attempt to list at the valuation above a billion dollars, not even in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And they, will, they, have, they stand a chance to do it. Why? Because there was a cashless policy, even though it was not fully implemented. So you're going to wake up and do and implement a policy that is that strong, and the next thing you're going to do is issue a memo. And so what happens after? Everybody is out there, you know, not fully understanding the pros and cons of that policy, mm -hmm. and they're about to shut down something that has the potential to deliver socioeconomic 
you know, benefit to the to the country. Do you understand? I think that it goes back to the second thing I always say. We are not a people of process. So you issued that precedent till now. We do not even have any campaign. The first time there was a pilot of the cashless policy, there was a bit of drive. You have to engage stakeholders. So the same people who've sent to represent us in the House of Assembly, excuse me, the legislators are going to shut those things down. Perhaps because they don't know better, because they, already, or they only see the cons, which is what will happen. So I think that from, 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 um, from one of the things he also you know, did mention about how you know, there seemed to be a lot of corruption, I, I, I slightly disagree. Okay. I think that there's corruption everywhere in the world. I think the system and processes that helps you to check that it doesn't continue to fester. So when uh, we had the last administration under uh, the People's Democratic Party, we did make a lot of noise about corruption. So we, for example, we had subsidy then. Okay, now we are in another uh, party, and then we have um, corruption again. And now we are calling what we used to call subsidy mm -hmm. uh, under recovery. So we are going to have another government. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have processes and systems in place, we're going to have that same problem. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the issue of um, refinery, like you said, refined product, I think that, again, we are not properly educated about our problem. Okay. So, I've so, so. always been an advocate for the removal of subsidy, but there has to be certain things right. in place. If we do not have a 21st century transport system in place, we are going to really feel the pain of the removal of subsidy. Okay, so going back to Mr. Logan, sorry to seem to have accused you of laying blame, <laughs> but um, let's go back to what Amaka said. We want to use the president's speech as a kind of report card. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you were able to listen to the speech. Yeah, I listened. And him. maybe if you heard previous ones. Uh, what, were there anything said there that gave you optimism? I'm highly optimistic about Nigeria in the so sense that someday the creative leadership will emerge. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think the uniting force will be given back to. And except we define our point of unity, we'll be walking in different directions. Mm -hmm. I'll give my practical examples. In 1953, there was this Kano riot, mm -hmm. which came out of an argument between the North and the South. The Northern uh, clique wanted to remain under the colonialism. The Southern people said, we must go. And it led to killing of human beings. Many were injured. And today, we have an escalated version of regional rivalries. Okay. Mm -hmm. You see, because one of the things the president brilliantly mentioned this morning is the fact that we must all collectively come together uh, to fight insecurity. Mm -hmm. And the chief of army staff was telling us earlier this week that we need spiritual prayers to fight insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I know how much you have expended in terms Spiritual of billions prayers. of dollars <laughs> in bringing hardware. I know That's how military base have been overrun. I know how at the point in this country, the customs that should be controlling our borders were giving us reports of people importing ammunition into this country, mm -hmm. importing military camouflage, and you come out to read how kidnappers wear military camouflage, how some people in their business uh, clique go and kill farmers and things like that. And so how are we going to fight that insecurity? And I feel disturbed when there is, you know, a paraphernalia of resources put together and an institution called government that Chapter 2 of Nigerian Constitution mandates to carry out the primary functions of government, which is the security and the welfare of the people, pushing it back to me. Mm. And if I... Today I'm so excited, and I pray in line with the request of the Chief of Army Staff <laughs> that God in heaven we deliver Nigeria and uproot all those who are sponsoring Boko Haram, sponsoring bandits, sponsoring crime against this nation. That is my prayer. Because some have said, we, we, we have brilliant examples. We were in the Civil War. It should have taught us a lesson. But someone said, we need to learn from our success or no, no, our failures. Look at Rwanda. Paul Kagame was advising Nigeria on even how to fight corruption. Mm. Okay. That nation was in serious crisis, genocide. In fact, the men ran. But the women started mobilizing. And today, it's one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And talk about revenue. I have said it. I keep echoing it. I think in 2017, Rwanda brought in about $400 million from tourism alone. 
all right and they have gone into collaboration with arsenal to bring and they have created an enabling and a peaceful environment for tourists to come god has blessed his nation and in rwanda you don't claim any ethnicity because they have yeah, learned so from their genocide uh, ignorance mm -hmm. all right but here you see the political elite bringing ticket of religion, of ethnicity, and things like that. And I'm, I keep on asking this question. And I'm setting an agenda this morning. I've been holding it everywhere I go. Recently, I hope you know that it was reported that six mine-resistant military vehicles yeah, were imported into this country yeah. and intercepted in a northern state by the soldiers, the customs, and it's in the possession of what do we need them for? Who are the importers? Are we in a war when in the UAE we have a minister of artificial intelligence? There is, you know, an academic of, a, academy of artificial intelligence. Those guys are already engaging hundreds of years of global economy. Right now, China is at the point of rounding up the foundation of constructing the longest bridge above, across the sea. Great things are happening, all right, and we are still here negotiating with bandits. So I think we have been plagued by recycled leadership, recycled problems, and we have not united to move forward. Okay, I mean, so... All right, and you... uh, except we, the leaders who have the responsibility to manage Nigeria now, bring about that concept of unity. I don't want to hear anybody telling me in my great country where we almost declared a state of emergency in education and we are debating who is president in 2023. Okay, so I mean, no, those are issues that bother me. So that brings us to I, our next line of thought, you know, which is looking at the, the elements of the speech of the president. We would say that he talked about education, he talked about job creation, he talked about security, you know, he mentioned past sector, agriculture, you know, and even health. Now, part of before we came here, we want to quickly look at the power sector. Before we came here, we were having the conversation because he mentioned, uh, can yeah. I, you, we might yes, want I mean, to I, I had Actually, I, I made reference to the 2017 speech because I just found myself looking at previous speeches uh, just to see if anything has changed. Um, and he seemed to be saying in that speech that um, th we had reached, as at the time he was making the speech, 7,001 megawatts. That's September 2017. And his target then was that we would target for 10,000 megawatts by 2020. And now, in 2019, just a year behind that, he seemed to be now targeting 5 gigawatts, 7 gigawatts, and 11 gigawatts by 2023. 2023. So, you know, you compare like with like. And so I'm trying to say, in terms of just like I'm happy Amaka raised the power sector, let's even just isolate one sector. Are we doing one, one step forward and two steps back? What, what sense of progress do you get? listening to that um so you see the <laughs> the problem in the power sector it's simple and at the same time complex mm -hmm. it's simple uh, because complex. you would assume that if there's so much demand for something then there should be enough supply yeah, or okay. there should be enough appetite to put for supply but we have a system that is not working and we, we are a bit too hard on ourselves i beg you know to to really really say that Sometimes we use what I call vanity metrics. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of generating 10,000 megawatts if we cannot distribute or transmit the 10,000 megawatts? Mm -hmm. um, um, I was discussing with some friends, I think over the weekend, and you know, I did say that, have you noticed that every time, I think we cross about 4,500 megawatt transmission, mm -hmm. the national grid, the, you hear a report that the national grid has collapsed and then there will, <laughs> there will black out. So what's that saying? That transmission system just don't have the power to transmit that. It takes a while to be able to do it. Then we started to look at the IPP. The IPP seemed to be working, but you know we're still having certain challenges there. I think that generating 10,000 is not what we should focus on. It's how do we have policies and you know and um, 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 ideas in place that allows us to see, that allows us to solve the problem and nip it in the bud. So look at what, and like you said, it seems like we don't learn from our mistakes and our successes. Sounds so for like example, somewhere like Magodo today enjoys between 20 to 24 hours 
of power supply. Okay. They call it the premium power. Mm. Some of the policies that they're trying to implement, I think it's a brilliant one. What's saying is that if you can pay for it, you'll have it. We'll give it you'll have it. Why? There's kind of circumventing government policy that is trying to, you know, put a cap and, you know, put a cap on the price of power. But it's working somewhere. So if you stay in Magodo, you probably won't have to bother about the noise pollution of Jen, the, you know, the green, yeah. um, you know, the, 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 the climate change effect and all of that because you're not enjoying power. So I think that for power, rather than, which is why sometimes I, I, I do not pay so much attention to some of these speeches because they seem not to you drill not. down on the real issues. What's, what's about generating the problem? How has the policy mm -hmm. worked? So you've gone to check what he said in 2017 and what is being said now. Mm -hmm. there doesn't, it doesn't seem like when this speech was being prepared, there was reference to what was said before about okay. power. <laughs> okay. do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So because if there was reference to it, I think that would have come to say, oh, in 2017, this was the issue. There was nowhere in Nigeria where you know you could. And this have, is why where, where we are. This now. is where we are, and then there will be a collective reasoning, you know, to say, okay, as far as power is concerned, maybe we, it should be an isolate and fix. Hmm. I, and sometimes, maybe because of my own uh, medical related background, I'm, I studied microbiology. Hmm. I always try to do this. Let's isolate the problem and solve it one by one. If something is too big. Don't try and you know just solve it. Just isolate the problem and solve it in silos. Mm -hmm. And I think that that should be our approach to some of these things. And like you said, I think we really need a melting point. Have you seen anything? And if you think back, there are a few things that have happened in our country that affects everybody. Do you see how everybody is talking about it, both the rich and the poor, mm -hmm. the politician and the non-politician? Do you understand? I think we need a melting point. And I think that at, with Nigeria at 59, but you know, all of us as Nigerian. We need to start to set the agenda to say that what is our melting point mm -hmm. as a country? It will not be religion, it will not be ethnicity. I mean, I was reading online yesterday, we have over 500 languages in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you understand? So we need a melting point. When we have that melting point, then we'll move to saying, okay, if we must choose leaders, it has to be on merit. If we must do X, Y, Z, and then we'll start, and then we'll move to a place where we can start to think of, oh, becoming a country like Singapore, I think if we don't have that, without the collectiveness, we are not going to you know, be able to um, achieve. Okay, much. Mr. Logo, I can see you're smiling, but hold your thoughts there. We'll come back to you. We'll take a quick break now. You're still watching uh, Nigeria at 59 here on Plus TV Africa. And stay with us. We'll be back in a moment.